Next speaker is Jill van Valligem. Um, Jill has a very interesting background in uh, uh, parasitology um, from Belgium. And then he did uh, his PhD in host pathogen interactions with Trypanosoma brucei. Um, I have no idea what that is, but uh, that sounds very, very uh, fancy. Um, so, uh, and apparently they can affect the brain and cause all sorts of mayhem. Um, and uh, this is part of why he got interested in neuroscience. And so now he's working um, on zebrafish sensory processing and is slowly transitioning into the enteric nervous system. And he, it sounds like he's also uh, on the job market. So if you know of any uh, positions he might fit in, please let him know. Okay, and today he'll be talking about calcium imaging and the curse of negativity. All yours. Thank you, Gunnar, for the introduction. And yeah, the title is probably appropriate for Halloween. So yes, uh, as he said, I'm going to talk a bit about this uh, so-called curse of negativity, uh, which is a bit of a tongue-in-cheek name and title. Um, so we have a, a preprint uh, that you can check out if you want to know more of the details. Uh, but this, I'll try to keep brief because I'm interested in feedback and what people think of it. So as we've seen uh, with the previous speakers, uh, calcium imaging is amazing. So this is a whole brain uh, maximum intensity projection of a fish to whom we're playing sound. So this one is not uh, the one that we also shared on Twitter, which is the zebra fish responding to hammer time. Um, but um, so we, we have this beautiful data sets. And as uh, Peter and Josh have uh, talked about, uh, obviously, this is quite different from uh, EFIs and from the spikes that we get. Uh, and ultimately, that's uh, one of the things that we would like to, to, to infer and to get. Um, and the thing is that uh, in a previous data set that we published uh, that was uh, spearheaded by uh, uh, ETF Averbul that you can see here in the top left corner. Um, so what, uh, in that case, what she's done is she's basically uh, invented tractor beams for zebrafish. And so she can move the otolith. So these are small uh, stone in the ear of the fish and she can move them using uh, optical tweezers to uh, generate uh, uh, sound, so that's a paper that's going to be um, published soon. But in the paper in which I helped her analyze the data, uh, it was to simulate vestibular uh, uh, stimulation, so movement and acceleration. And in that data set, uh, that's the first time that while we were doing the analysis, what we identified were basically positive and negative responses. So if you see here on the right, um, you'll see that the trace of the uh, neuron that's outlined in green, uh, it, you see the classical uh, positive transients of calcium that Josh and Peter have shown, uh, which of course, when the spike rate increases, then you get this, uh, this calcium transient that represent the spikes. Uh, however, what we also saw, and that was located in uh, very specific parts of the brain, so in, pur in purple uh, there and in uh, the red outline, that's the cerebellum of the zebrafish. And so in the dorsal part where we think it's probably Purkinje cells, but we are not 100% sure, um, we see those negative deviations from the baseline. And these were very consistent. We have many neurons that do it across multiple fish. It's not a movement artifact, so we made sure of all of these things. But these were negative deviations. So there are a couple of issues that come with that, is that a lot of the tools that have been developed to actually analyze calcium imaging data have been have this assumption that those calcium transients are always positive. So that you'll get uh, these spikes of uh, these increases in fluorescence, and these are where the focus is. And for example, if you look in the middle row uh, at the right, you see that the delta F over F, which is a classical way that uh, these data are processed, where you have a moving uh, window that goes along and you see the deviation from the moving uh, average. Well, if you do that and there is a negative deviation, depending on the size of the window, if you use a classical window as recommended in some of the papers, you actually create uh, positive artifacts, as you can see with the arrows. So you generate false increases in the calcium. So that's why we now use uh, only Z scoring of the fluorescence because uh, that does not create those weird artifacts uh, because of the moving average. There are other ways that you can deal with it, but that's the first point um, that I want to, to, to talk about is uh, the way that you actually normalize your data can 
generate those artifacts or hide those negative uh, transients that we've observed. So this is all in real data that was published um, in the paper that's at the bottom. So that's the first thing um, with these curse of negativity. The second thing that we've also seen is that there are many, many people in our field uh, that use non-negative assumptions in the way that the data is actually analyzed. So for example, here in the paper, again, we identify three clusters of responses. Uh, I won't go into the detail, details. I'm happy to answer questions about them, but you can also check the, the paper. But basically, we observed two classes of positive responses. Uh, which were responding to different powers of the trap of the optical tweezers, but we also observed this inhibited cluster of uh, responses. And this one we could only identify using a k-means approach to the clustering. It, obviously, if you use a non-negative matrix factorization approach, which has been used by other groups to cluster the responses, you would wipe those responses completely. There are other approaches where people uh, binarize their data uh, depending on uh, a threshold uh, of response, where if you need to reach a certain uh, delta F over F to be counted as active, obviously these would also wipe all of the, neg in the negative responses. So that's the second part of this, which is uh, to that some approaches for data analysis will uh, basically hide those responses. And finally, to try to a bit quantify those things and those issues, we turn to a simulation of uh, basically responses. And so we used Naomi that's been developed by Adam, Adam Charles, uh, which is um, a, a simulation toolbox that allows you to generate fluorescent movie based on uh, simulated spikes. And so it, uh, generate, you generate the spikes and then you get uh, the uh, predicted neural uh, activity uh, with a GCAMP uh, kernel. And then from that, you can generate the movies. And what I've done is I've then taken those movies and then I've put them through the classical, uh, most cited approaches to extract the fluorescence of calcium imaging data. So K-MAN uh, from, um, oh God. I'm blanking on uh, where it's from, um, uh, Flat Iron Institute, sorry, Cell Sort, which is a PCA-IC approach, and Sweet 2P uh, from uh, Carlson and Janelia. And so we've taken those uh, ideal movies and we've put them through all of these approaches. And uh, again, I can discuss uh, the, the details of uh, how we've done it, but the advantage is that we know all of the parameters of our data. So we don't have to like fine tune in other parameters of all of these models. And we can extract uh, the, the responses. We can look at uh, the, the neurons. So uh, it looks fine. Uh, they detect the neurons uh, easily. However, if you look at the correlation between the fluorescent traces, so the GCAM signal and the ideal responses uh, over time, uh, what you see is that uh, in green on the left, um, you see that all of these tools do a very good job at finding all of these activated neurons. However, if you look at the inhibited ones, so on the right uh, with the purple rectangle, you see that, for example, Cayman really struggles to find the inhibited neurons. So sort and 3 p deal with it fine. Um, and so if you look in fraction of ideal responses, you see that uh, K-MAN, cell sort, and sweet 2P find most of the neurons. Um, and uh, for the inhibited neurons, though, you see that K-MAN really struggles again. So this is uh, the third point, which is depending on the uh, algorithm that you use, you may miss more or less of those inhibited neurons. And finally, spike inference. So I won't have to explain to you uh, this because uh, Josh and Peter have done so. And to the right, you see the quantification that we've done. Uh, and uh, basically, the, on the activated neurons, most of the tools do fairly well, except cell salt, but it's a fairly old algorithm. Cascade with the universal model does very well on this better than the other ones. However, if you look at the inhibited neurons, you see that the uh, performance of Cascade, for example, uh, collapses. Sweet 2P does not do as well. K-MAN apparently uh, with the FOOPC um, implementation does fairly well. And that's something that we discussed with Peter quite a bit. And, uh, I'm thinking of training uh, some models with the inhibited neurons, but we're still ironing that out with Peter. Uh, there are a couple of uh, problems when, uh, when we try to make a universal model that includes the, the inhibited neurons. So in summary, uh, 
what my recommendations are, and we can discuss that, is that the C-scoring apparently generates way less artifacts than the DFNF with a moving baseline. That if you use a non-negative assumption in the way you analyze your data, such so as NMF or binarizing your data, you may miss an entire class of responses, which is what would have happened to us uh, if we had done so. Uh, Switch to P seems to be the most robust amongst all of these for finding the fluorescent traces, and FOOPC for the spike inference give the best results. And yeah, so I want to thank the lab. Uh, we're going to hire uh, a lot of people uh, next year. So if you're on the job market for neuroscience or computational neuroscience, keep an eye on uh, the Scott Lab uh, at uh, the University of Queensland. It's very sunny here, it's very nice. Uh, and so yeah, that's it. And I um, welcome all questions. Great, thank you so much, Jill. Questions? Do any of the other panelists have a question? Yeah, Peter. Yes, I'm wondering because you, you mentioned that you're, you you think that you have been recording from poor kidney cells. Have you? That's, are there any? Yeah. Are there, sorry. Go ahead. Sorry, any, finish your question. Sorry. Um, are there any um, EPS recordings from uh, poor kidney cells or are there any calcium recordings in mice from poor kidney cells? Um, I don't know about mice. Uh, we did try to record from Burkinia cell with IFIS. Um, however, uh, it was not successful. So we didn't manage to both have the electrophysiology recordings and the calcium uh, fluorescence working uh, perfectly. So that's something that we kind of dropped because we're not an IFIS lab and developing the, the whole thing was a bit tricky. Uh, we would be happy uh, to, 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 to verify that these are picking cell, but it's just one of our hypotheses. Cool. We have a question in the Q&A by Priscilla, uh, who asks, uh, which GCAM did you use? Do you think picking a different GCAM would change which algorithm works better? Uh, uh, so to answer the, the first question for the uh, real data that was done all with GCAM 6S, uh, for Naomi, the, the model uses GCAM 6F. I don't think it would change anything uh, because the, the so the, the issue is basically the, the those negative deviations happen when you have a tonic firing of a cell that basically is inhibited uh, during a, a stimulus. And that's something that Steinmetz has observed in his data set with NeuroPixel. 20% uh, of the neurons were actually inhibited uh, in response to the stimulus. And so as long as the uh, rising and decay time of your G-camp is higher than um, uh, the time in between each spike, you will have that kind of baseline high level of fluorescence that then is going to be dropped if the firing rate goes to zero or close to zero. Cool. Uh, another question by uh, Jeremy. Uh, so you'd need two models used sequentially, one for positive variations and one for negative, then merge the two. Downside is it would take more than twice to compute time. Um, so that's probably the ideal thing if you want to, to get the, it really depends what you, what you're looking at, right? If you, if it, you're talking about the, uh, fluorescence extraction, I think sweet 2 p works fairly decently for both inhibited and, uh, positive, uh, neurons. If you're talking about spike inference, um, I think that's not that expensive because, um, you could identify the negative deviations with many like computationally trivial tools to, to identify neurons that have these negative deviations. And then you could just pass these into like, for example, a train a cascade on an uh, inhibited neurons uh, data set and use that for your spike inference or uh, use FOOPC just for that uh, subset if you're, if you're really worried. So I think it's, it wouldn't be that computationally intense. Cool. Uh, any other questions from uh, the panelists? Yeah, Peter. Just, just to confirm, did I get this right? So neurons are either have negative deflections or positive deflections, but not both. Um, I In suspect the they could be both. Um, it's <clears throat> like, I don't from the top of my head know of any example of neurons that have a tonic firing uh, in the like one hertz range that you can see in vestibular neurons, for example, uh, vestibular response in neurons. Um, that would then change to a sparser firing rate. Uh, but I, I'm i not sure that doesn't exist somewhere in the brain. Um, and if you have something like 
uh, if you imagine that during a whole different arousal, you could have neurons that would have a high tonic rate, and then uh, at a lower arousal state, they could have a lower high. Yeah. So neurons could have um, could have a mix of both of these. Yeah. Great, um, Jill. There is a, a comment for you in the in the chat uh, by Priscilla. Just uh, don't miss that before uh, yeah. uh, we end the, uh, uh, the 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 webinar. Um, we have a couple minutes left, so I, I, I might use that to ask a question myself. So, so how common are these uh, in inhibited neurons, and and uh, and does that change depending on where you look in the brain? Um, so, in short, uh, so the best quantification that I would say, uh, and it comes with all the bias of, of course, this is analyzed data, right? So you you. Uh, you ditch a lot of things, uh, but uh, Stamets in his paper with all the neuropixel data that he generated, there was about, I think, 20% of the inhibited, of the cells that were inhibited. So that's a decent chunk of the responsive neurons. Uh, in our vestibular uh, responses, it was a fraction, uh, but I cannot remember exactly, but it's, it's I think, around 10% or something. So it's not like the, it's, it's not uh, insignificant uh, percentage of the neurons. Cool. Okay, that ends this session.